My name is Paula Braun. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I work in the National Center for Health Statistics. And for those of you who may be new to this concept of an entrepreneur in residence, it's a program through the Department of Health and Human Services. And we bring people with outside expertise who can take a fresh look at some of the intractable challenges that we face in the delivery of health care and the provision of health services. Uh, as one of the former chief technology officers of HHS said, we're hiring you, you're getting paid by the government to cause a ruckus within the government. And I thought, yes, I'd been doing that for years and <laughs> it was never fully appreciated, so it felt good to know that I was being hired for that specific purpose. I was the first EIR at CDC and the focus of my work has been primarily around mortality reporting, and I'm very excited to share that with you today, um, largely because I was new to FIRE three years ago. I, I knew nothing about it. And when I was looking through the lens of how do we improve the throughput of this data, how do we make it more timely, how do we make it more accurate, I saw the possibility to use the types of tools that we've all been hearing so much about over the past couple of days. And so, just to orient you, since some of the people in the audience maybe knew the concept of public health, I'll spend a few minutes at the beginning talking about that and what distinguishes public health from the traditional healthcare setting. And then I'll spend the majority of the presentation on examples of how we're using fire in mortality reporting and how we approached it. And then at, time, at the end, if there's time, and I, I intend to leave time for us to have a little Q&A. So let's get started on public health. Now public health is what we do as a society collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. And what distinguishes public health from healthcare is that when you go to your doctor, you're an individual and your doctor may assign a specific treatment to you. It, you know, it could be a medication, it could be a diet and exercise protocol, but you're impacting healthcare one patient at a time, typically in a clinical setting. Public health is a little different because we think about entire populations and entire communities. So when we think of a public health intervention, we're looking at things like fluoride in water. We're looking at things like seatbelt laws. We're looking at things like smoke-free environments for clean air. We're looking at things like clean water. We're looking at things like immunizations where the benefits accrue at the population level. And this is the lens through which we do the work at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as your state and local health departments. And when we think about the foundational capabilities of public health, there are the 10 of them that are represented here on this wheel. And as you can imagine, it's not that there's one entity that controls all of these actions. There's really deep interdependence upon different types of organizations. And we all need to be able to work together to try to drive and improve the types of health outcomes that really impact where we work, where we play, where we live, where we pray. And we don't wanna just do this on an ad hoc basis. We really want to have timely and specific information upon which to base these decisions, upon which to evaluate whether our actions are having the intended uh, results. And so when we think about public health interoperability, we have some challenges that are similar to the challenges that exist in the healthcare sector, but are also somewhat unique. Um, the workforce in the public health informatics space is not necessarily performing at the same level that you see in other sectors. And so when we think about boots on the ground, um, how do you make improvements across an ecosystem, you really have to take that under consideration. And so what I like to think about it is, if we're gonna think about what sort of technologies we're going to adopt, I like to think five, 10, 15 years in the future, are we gonna actually have enough students coming out of engineering schools that will even have the, the bandwidth or the interest of maintaining our legacy IT infrastructure? Maybe, most likely not. So part of my role as an EIR is helping CDC and public health agencies 
better understand these newer technologies that are being more widely adopted and how we can leverage them to address our, our needs. Same thing with interoperability. You know, people like to think, oh, you work for the CDC. There's all this information that you have access to, and that, that's true. There's a lot of information that's aggregated at the national level. But in fact, most of the information in public health resides at the state level and the local level. So there's a great deal of coordination that takes place within those entities and across those entities. And there's a lot of information that flows across the different levels as well. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit to my favorite topic, which is mortality. And you might wonder, we've spent all this time talking about health at the introduction, so why, you know, where does mortality fit into this? And I like to think of a death certificate as a snapshot of the way that we lived our lives. It includes some demographic information. It includes our name, our race, our gender. It includes information about what our occupation was over the course of our lifetime. And it also includes one of the most important diagnoses you'll ever get, which is the sequence of diseases or injuries that led to your death. And why that matters is that in the United States, it's very difficult to get comprehensive information on a population level, largely because of the way healthcare is delivered in our country. But we have a tremendous amount of information at the very beginning of our lives and the very end of our lives for all, for everybody across the nation. Because we collect health information on our birth certificates and we collect health information on our death certificates. And when we think about how resources are allocated, when we think about whether we're looking at, you know, are we making improvements in cancer? Are we making improvements in drug overdoses? The source that many people refer to are the national vital statistics data. And so it's that information from death certificates. And so one of the first things that I did as an entrepreneur in residence was I thought about how do the data flow from the point somebody dies to the point the data are aggregated in our office at the National Center for Health Statistics. And it's really a bifurcated reporting process. And it, it boils down to the people that provide the information on the medical port of the death certificate and the people who provide the demographic information. The demographic information is normally provided by a funeral home provider. The medical information, it actually gets a little bit more complicated, because depending on the circumstances that surrounded your death, did, was it a natural death, or did you die suddenly and unexpectedly, will determine who certifies your death certificate. And so most natural deaths are certified by a physician, and most um, sudden and unexpected deaths are certified by either a medical examiner or a coroner. And there's different challenges to trying to integrate tools into those environments. And then what happens is there may be some local registration, but ultimately the death gets registered at the state level. And so every state, New York City, Washington DC, and the five territories have an electronic death registration systems. And those are the workhorse of our public health surveillance around deaths. And my goal as an entrepreneur in residence was to think about how can we provide tools that the physicians can use, that the medical examiners and coroners can use, where we could pull together at a point in time a more complete picture about this decedent and give them more context and a more nuanced understanding of what led to this person's death. And how can we get it without having them to re-enter the re-enter information into a standalone electronic death registration system? How can we actually embed it into their workflow, send it to the state, then have the state send it to the National Center to help for Health Statistics and back in real time, recognizing that we're not the only ones that have a need for this data? So can we come up with the basic infrastructure that would provide it? to multiple data providers to meet multiple use cases. And that's around the time that I met Graham Grieve, and it became very clear to me that in order for us to do this in a scalable way, in order for us to do this in a way that would 
pivot us to, to move from more of a historical repository of information to a real-time data feed, we really needed to be looking at standards, and we needed to be looking at standards that supported RESTful APIs, and that's where my first introduction to FHIR began. And so I had this vision that we at the National Center for Health Statistics could work in concert with our state counterparts in the Vital Records Office, and we could provide a set of tools and a set of standards that would make it easier to provide that more specific and up-to-date information in a way that fit into the data provider's workflow across all these different jurisdictional boundaries so that way those data users could get more value out of the data that were being collected and the data providers could get more value out of the data that were being collected without having to place any additional burden on the data providers or minimize the additional burden that was placed on the data providers. And so the first step in this was we wanted to say, well, how well are the data on a death certificate already represented in FHIR? And so we worked with a team of students at um, the Georgia Institute of Technology, also known as Georgia Tech, and they went through and did the mapping with us. And we've continued to do that work, and thanks uh, largely to the work that the MITRE Corporation has been doing with us, and HI3 uh, Solutions will be doing some more work with us in this respect. We've actually gone through the process of profiling the information on the death certificate, and we didn't do this in a vacuum. The National Center for Health Statistics has been very forward-thinking around standards and had developed V2 standards within HL7 as well as CDA standards and IHE profiles. So we're dealing with how do we make all of this consistent, and then how do we also create our fire profiles in a way that they can run in a production environment. So we have to be aware of all the work that's going on in the Argonaut project, the work that's going on in the US Corps, and other profiles that are um, currently in production. And the reason why this excites me is that death reporting isn't just um, you know, my, my day job. It actually has this very rich historical significance to it, dating back to the days of the bills of mortality. And if we could take this process that's hundreds of years old, and if we could transform it to something that's truly fire-enabled, then we could be the use case that other parts of public health could look to as they think about wrestling with similar challenges. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the suite of tools that we've developed so far to assist with natural deaths, and then I'm gonna switch to the sudden unexpected deaths because there are even more challenges with those deaths. So my first idea when I learned about fire and I learned about Smart on Fire was, well, of course, we could probably solve a lot of this if we just had a really well-designed Smart on Fire app that could run in an electronic health record, that could fetch the information from that record or from a health information exchange, that could present it on a screen, and that would allow the clinician to have a much deeper understanding of what was this person's life like before they died. And the reason why this is important is because we see 2.6 million deaths a year at the National Center for Health Statistics. And more often than not, we get a cause of death that might only be one line. And everybody kind of dies of a heart attack, right? It's, what was the underlying condition that led to the heart attack? because uh, you can't really base public health policy if you don't have enough information to ascertain that underlying condition. And so for those types of deaths that occurred in a hospital setting, where you might get a resident woken up in the middle of the night who knew very little about this patient, there's the potential to provide them enough information that they would need to give their best medical diagnosis about what was that sequence of events and thanks in large part to the work that Jeff Duncan had done in Utah, we knew that when you provide clinicians tools within their electronic health record, they tend to provide more complete information on death certificates. So we really just saw fire 
as an opportunity to make those types of tools more scalable and to allow those types of tools to really take advantage of the types of analytics that you know, Google was talking about yesterday with TensorFlow. And that was really my vision. Like This was the moonshot. Could we build something like this? And so this was the paper prototype of, of what we thought it could look like, and that it would give a snapshot of the patient's history. It would provide some sort of sense of the temporality. That's what the timeline represents here. It would give some kind of a easily readable results of the analytics, and that it would have the same four-line cause of death that the clinicians are already familiar with on a death certificate. And so we did a lot of work um, in that first year just to try to figure out what could the profiling look like? Could we get a basic UI that could run in an electronic health record? Could we run some pretty basic analytics off of existing data? And we found that it was promising. And so the next step was to take that initial tool, and uh, again, I have to give MITRE a lot of credit for doing that, and then building it into a more robust um, smart app. And we don't have the, the analytics in this app yet, but we do have is a nice, clean user interface that's been tested at IHE Connectathons, that's been shown at our, um, our conferences for the vital records community, and we just had one at the beginning of, of this month, and I'm telling you, the interoperability showcase was kind of like the Hamilton of the NAFSA's annual meeting. Like, <laughs> you had to wait in line two or three sessions before you could get in and see these tools, which is exciting because it means that this community is now ready to participate in, in this type of development. And along very similar lines, our colleagues from the state of New Hampshire who are here on my right, your left side of the room, had also developed a cause of death app that leveraged the fire standard. And so we're now converging around a basic way of collecting and exchanging information and providing tools that can either work within the clinician's electronic health record system that they use every day or work on a mobile device, Apple, Google, you know, Android, whatever, and then they could take it out into the field with them because we want to make the process of certifying deaths something that's not burdensome on the individual certifiers, something that you know, they can fit into their daily lives. Now, sudden and unexpected deaths prevent, or present more challenges. By definition, they're sudden and unexpected. So <laughs> the information in the health record is important, but it gives a much smaller piece of the overall puzzle. And so I mentioned earlier that medical examiners and coroners are the ones who certify these deaths. And I like to think of them really as the masters of interpretation because they work with these teams of interdisciplinary people. They work with the um, death investigators who are the first to respond to this scene. They work with toxicologists and histologists and other uh, medical professionals who pull the information together. They work with forensic pathologists. Some of them are forensic pathologists. And they, they have to pull all that information together at a point in time, assess it, and make a very difficult decision, one that they have to stand up to in court, which is a little bit different from typically when a physician certifies a, a death certificate. It, um, it, testifying is not a routine part of their job. And so here's a little bit of a more in-depth look at the different pieces of information that um, happens for an unnatural death. But the death has to be re uh, referred to the medical examiner coroner jurisdiction. And uh, there's really three main pillars here. There's the circumstances that surrounded the death. There's the examination of the body. And then there's all the other ancillary tests that are run. And all of that gets distilled, and the most pertinent information ends up on the death certificate. And we aggregate that at the national level through the states. But there's a tremendous amount of information that's in those medical examiner and coroner case management systems that contains an unbelievable amount of, um, unbelievable amount of information that's used routinely by federal organizations, state organizations, companies with um, 
everything from trying to determine what sort of regulations need to be passed, try to determine what sort of policies need to be passed. These are the types of deaths that are most likely potentially preventable. And so when I talk about that potential secondary use of the data, it's really underscored by everything that's happening right now with drug overdose deaths. And this next series of slides, for those of you who may not have already seen them, track the deaths starting in 1999. And this is something that we at the National Center for Health Statistics, Margaret Warner, who's sitting right here, is actually one of the analysts who noticed it. We could see that there was an increase in drug overdose deaths even before the public health surveillance systems were notifying that. And it's largely because at that time, the public health surveillance systems that were focused on drug overdose deaths were located in urban areas. And so they were missing the drug overdose deaths that were happening in rural areas. And because we collect information on all deaths across the entire country, we were able to pick that up in our data. And so just starting in 99, you could see there's a few pockets starting here in West Virginia and then out in New Mexico. And then year by year, you can see it becoming more and more prevalent across larger and larger parts of the country. And it's growing. This is impacting all ages, all races, and large parts of the country. And it's recognition of this public health crisis. We received funding from the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Initiative to be able to work closely with these medical examiner and coroner communities and to work closely with the vital records communities to figure out are there ways that we can actually make this a more real-time data feed. So we don't have to wait a year or two years to get the most up-to-date official information to act on. We want to turn this into a real-time feed. And the reason why it matters that it's real-time is that this is an evolving um, this is an evolving crisis. In the early days, most of the increase in drug overdose deaths were because of overprescribing of methadone. And then when that was course corrected, there was still an increase in prescription opioids. Now if you look to the more recent years, you'll notice that heroin and other synthetic opioids are what's driving the increases. And we don't know what the next wave of this is going to look like, but we do know that we'll, it will be represented in the vital statistics data and in the medical examiner and coroner case management systems. So it's very important that we have a way of, of tapping into that. And so as you can imagine, the demand for these data keep increasing. We work closely with our public health and public safety partners, but everybody wants their data now, and everybody wants their data in the format that's easiest for them. So you can imagine what it's like to be in that medical examiner or coroner case management system office or be in that vital records office and have this swarm of data requesters who descend upon you and ask for that information in different ways. It's not scalable. These offices are already overburdened. And we can do better. And so since these systems weren't designed to exchange information with one another, they spend so much unnecessary time fetching and translating and transcribing the data over and over and over again to meet these disparate data requires, or requesters' needs. And what's resulting is this unnecessary tension between the people who want to provide the data to us and those of us who are requesting the data. And it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg problem, right? We're not going to develop systems to request data if there's 2,400 different ways of serving it up across the country. And if those 2,400 people across the country have to provide it 20,000 different ways, then there's no incentive for them to standardize either. And so our approach to this is to think about how do we bring people together and work in new ways around consistent standards that leverage basic internet protocols to try to, to get to the point that we can get 90% of drug overdose deaths 
coded within 90 days of the date of death. And so the way we're approaching it is modeled after the way the Argonaut group has been working within the fire community. And we've brought together, through a competitive process, a group of six states. And we're calling them our implementers work group or implementers community. And those states are California, Florida, Georgia, um, Michigan, New York, and New Hampshire. And what's so exciting for us is that these six states have taken a very forward-leaning posture and said, we want to be part of this developing the solution around this. And so it's not just Paul LeBron coming up with ideas about, hey, there's this thing called fire that we could use that could you know, probably help us solve a lot of this. They're going to be sitting down and building the tools alongside us. And they're going to be the ones who are going to be committing the resources to testing it out and getting it into production. And we're really excited to be part of the fire community and the HL7 community because you have already figured out the whole connect-a-thon process. And we don't have to reinvent that for ourselves. And you're just really nice people to be around anyway. But you can see here. Not all pieces of this are ready for fire. The information that's collected at death scenes is really kind of all over the place. It could be a trained medical legal death investigator. It could be the local law enforcement. A lot of it's just unstructured notes. That's not really prime time fire ready. Same thing with autopsy reports. But the toxicology reports that come from the lab information systems, there's some potential there. The information that's coming from the medical examiner, or I'm sorry, the, the, the medical record, there's a lot of potential there. And so our thought is, if we get the medical examiners and coroners to work closely with their vital records office and to build out these fire interfaces um, and to demonstrate that this information can be reported not just to the vital records office, but other offices within their state and other offices at the national level, and you can start to do more real-time analytics on it, we're hoping that we'll demonstrate the continued value of the vital statistics data. And so we're not going to try to boil the ocean here. We're trying to be very targeted in what are the information flows that we're um, hoping to enable. And we're not defining that for them. You know, we're working with the community and presenting them with stakeholders who have you know, a need. But it's, it's really up to them to identify their priorities and doing this series of build, test, learn, feedback lo loops to iteratively arrive at workable solutions. And these are just some of the basic questions that we asked ourselves during the first kickoff meeting that we held last month. Um, I'm flying to Washington, DC tonight because I'm having a similar meeting with representatives from the toxicology and forensic um, forensic pathology community about how we can do this. But what's exciting to me is that when we talk about this approach, it's, it's very new to public health. And in some respects, it's new to public safety. But we're getting resounding interest from people that I never expected to get interest from. And we just have to say, hey, we're, we're having this listening session. And I think we have, what, 40 different organizations that are coming tomorrow. And we ha invited half of them, thinking we might get half of that show up. And so I can attest to the type, the level of enthusiasm and um, the promise of this. And I look forward to continuing to, to brief you on this um, and just to hear from you what questions or ideas you have for us. So I, I stopped early intentionally to leave some questions. We have some folks in the room who've developed some of these tools. You know, we can demonstrate those if those are of interest to folks. But, um, I'll stop there for now. Thank you all. Yes. Yeah, so at this point, uh, both of the tools that I showed are smart on fire tools. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, the question was the, the tools that I had shown earlier in the presentation can pull them back up on the screen. Oh, this is going to take a little while to go backwards. We can watch the opioid overdose deaths in, in reverse. <laughs> but um, so this tool, the New Hampshire, I'm sorry, the, the National Electronic Cause of Death tool that was built by the state of New Hampshire is available now. It's in production in New Hampshire. 
we're looking for other states that are interested and willing and taking it into production. And then uh, this, this standardized death certificate tool, would you guys want to speak about what it would take to, to make that production ready? We've, I know we've tested it against the Epic Sandbox. Um, we did some early stage development work against the Cerner Sandbox, and you, you got that running, I think, So at this point, what would, it would have to happen would be for a state to say, yes, we want to make this happen, and then a hospital system that would want to pair with the state on it. Great question. Thank you. Floyd. Well, we just happen to have the registrar from the state of New Hampshire here. Steve, would you like to come up and answer the question? I'll give you the... The question was the volume of uh, folks that are using the NECOD application in New Hampshire. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> NECOD um, was deployed originally as was uh, deployed originally just in the medical examiners. And we, that was the um, the bang for the buck. Where do we go for the most diverse, compl complicated information? And we pick the medical examiner's office. NECOD is now deployed in 100% of the medical examiner's cases. Um, we, um, the med we have three medical examiners and uh, 25 death investigators. Every one of those individuals are using our tool, NECOD, on a um, iPad that we purchased for them for this, you know, real live beta testing of, of how we uh, how we go forward. This initiative, we've made several changes to it. As you get, you know, the best test is to go live. Um, we've made several changes, and now we're rolling it out to the individuals, the the large volume certifiers in New Hampshire, as just the normal um, clinicians. Yeah. So the question was, are we extracting information or asking them to, to re-enter it? And it's, my understanding is that it's, there's some pieces of the death certificate that require the certifier to make a cause of death determination. And that can't be abstracted from anything. But we have done a pilot with the VA on their open API platform called Lighthouse that demonstrates how we could fetch the information from the VA medical record system and present it right there in the NECOD application, and we're going to continue to iteratively do development in that, along that vein. Yeah. And the answer to your, ultimately, the answer to your question is no, but that's what we're developing now. Thanks, Floyd. Other questions or ideas? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, the, the adverse event reporting system. So at this point, we're working closely with the vital registration community, and we're briefing other parts of CDC, and we welcome other parts of public health who are interested in taking this approach to, to reach out to us, and we're happy to share what we're doing. Yeah. Yes. Oh, live births, yeah. So um, we're starting with death reporting because that's where we're getting the financial support at the moment. Um, I don't want to necessarily speak on behalf of, of Utah, but I know that you've done some basic prototyping of what this could look like for birth reporting. The question was around, you know, we're doing this for deaths. Are we doing anything for births? And the answer is stealth production or stealth development is underway, and we're, we're hoping that... Um, as resources become available, we could also develop something like this for BERTs. BERTs are more straightforward in the sense that you don't have to determine a cause of birth. It's, you know, it's... <laughs> the, my hypothesis is that most of it's alcohol, but, you know... <laughs> it might be the same for many of the causes of death, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> we could end on that one. <laughs> okay, thanks, y'all, and I'm here if anybody else has questions after the end.